Hello, everybody. Uh, this, is, this panel is priorities for pit funding. Um, philanthropy has played a role in organizing, formalizing, publicizing, and funding the field of public interest technology. Five years on from Pitt UN's inception, we have a number of successes to celebrate, from proof of concept projects to interdisciplinary research centers to Pitt degree programs, and many more of the things that you've heard over the last um, day and a half. As we look forward, however, <laughs> um, what priorities should guide funders' next steps as we seek to leverage the networks and the infrastructure that have emerged in order to grow and expand the field? That's sort of the driving question for us in this conversation. Um, in this panel, funders from across the public interest tech ecosystem will discuss key learnings from their grant-making journey thus far and what values and priorities should guide the next phases of philanthropic investment. And I was deliberate in saying the public interest tech ecosystem because some funders may not even name it public interest tech on their space. Um, and we've been talking about translation and as um, some fundraising raisers in the audience know, and I'm saying this because I was a grant writer, you have to figure out how to translate what you're doing to the priorities that you see listed on various applications. So the Pitt ecosystem framework was helpful for me to say that. And so we'll start with Jenny Toomey and Ford. <laughs> yeah. We're going to ask you to introduce yourself and um, talk a little bit about the aspect of your work that is connected to our theme. So, uh, hi, I'm Jenny Toomey, and I am the director of something called the Catalyst Fund at Ford, which was a three-year, $50 million uh, fund that was set up just to build the field of public interest technology. We think of public interest technology along the lines of investments the foundation made in the 60s, which was public interest law. Um, and we looked at the different quadrants and we think of academia as one, which is training people differently to be effective in other places than just the private sector and academia. Um, and then the other three quadrants are kind of more like the demand side. How do you get the right kinds of really good paying and powerful jobs in government, in civil society, and even in the private sector. Um, and I can talk more about that later. Does that sound right? Good. Katie? Hi. I'm Katie Knight. I'm the president at Siegel Family Endowment, which is a private foundation focused on the impact of technology on society. And I'm sure in this room, it'll be no surprise. That means we do a lot of different things. Um, we're focused on learning, workforce, and infrastructure, and the ways in which technology can be leveraged for good, but also the ways in which we can mitigate the risk and harm of pervasive technology across society. Public interest tech for us is both um, an interest unto itself and also something that we consider part of our infrastructure work. So when we talk about infrastructure, it's really about not just roads and bridges, but the physical, digital, and social connections that sort of underpin a thriving society where people have access to opportunity. And in that frame, of course, public interest technology and the idea that we need to be building tech for the public good and in the interest of the citizens makes a lot of sense as we think about the ways to shore up and reinforce our infrastructure. So when Jenny came to us several years ago now um, with, with Darren and Ford and said, hey, we want to think about public interest tech the way we think about public interest law. Um, the only thing, negative thing we had to say was that PIT was not a good acronym. Um, <laughs> we are, we're guilty of sometimes calling it PI tech because our chairman likes that better, but we've uh, acquiesced, we've given in to PIT at this point. And um, it's been really central to our grant making interests ever since. And it comes in many forms, I think, as a, a funder that tries to be more flexible. I find myself seeking out, you know, to Andrine's point, the many different names and phrases that people are using to describe public interest tech. So whether it's responsible computing or ethics and computer
computer science or you know anything else that in the university space might be a consideration, not just of how to build it, but why and what we're building and what impact it has is of interest to us. Saha. Thank you so much, Katie. And on the topic of responsible computing and translation, um, my name is Yad Borat. I'm a fellow with the Responsible Computing Challenge at the Mozilla Foundation, which, um, for those of you who might know, sits on top of the Mozilla Corporation. Uh, I think the, the Fox and Firefox in, in general. And what the Responsible Computing Challenge does is it, it attempts to embed ethics in computer science and data science ecosystems and as a pedagogical intervention. Um, and I say this as, a, as someone who has a political theory background, um, but also a recovering professional in the industry space, um, in telecoms in particular. I was looking for something like this when I was in those spaces. I came into political theory looking for ethics, looking for thinking about the ways in which I was deploying technologies into the space and seeing that in the university environments, I wasn't quite getting that. So what we do is we make grants across universities. I oversee the US implementation um, with PIs and professors to embed ethics into their core curricula and empower students to be able to think about these things more critically. Because that's actually something to bring the loop circular is something that I wish I would have had um, in, my, in my undergrad experience, uh, especially when I was in some of these spaces. So the work in which we're doing and uh, the way in which we're partnering with our other co-funders, which is Schmidt Futures, Mellon Foundation, Craig Newmark, uh, Philanthropies, uh, the Omidyar Network, and Rockefeller Brothers, to do this is quite a party, as you can imagine, but it's, it's important work because it's a root cause intervention, um, as we see it. And uh, to Andreen's point, to Katie's point, to Jenny's point, this is all a, uh, an exercise in translation, really, because we are working in, this, in similar fields with a lot of overlap, and there's so much scope to collaborate here. Shana. Good morning, everyone. Um, what a beautiful day to talk about Pitt. <laughs> um, so my name is Shana Crumley. I'm the director of Impact Data Science at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. So it's a, a yet a different but unique, I think, way to have social impact happen within a company. So we sit within the company of MasterCard as a social impact and philanthropy hub, um, separate from the foundation, which is outside. Um, and so because of that, we're particularly I think aligned with um, the, the business strategy and, and priorities and we're able to draw on the expertise, the data, the people, the um, networks of the company um, to pull it into the social impact space. When we started the center about 10 years ago now, the, the remit was to focus on um, building an inclusive digital economy. We know how to do um, economic growth really well, but looking at inclusive economic growth um, was the, the focus of the center. So that's um, mostly been focused in financial inclusion, small business growth, and then my portfolio, which is impact data science. We came into impact data science because we are a data company. And we have a lot to offer and, and um, to draw on, but also because we had worked for so long with small businesses, with um, networks of entrepreneurs, with CDFIs, um, and all of these institutions across the social and, and civil sector and public sector, there was always a common thread of um, a need for more data capacity, more data expertise, knowledge, tools, um, funding, and resources. And so we focused specifically on impact data science for that for that reason. I think it dovetails with um, with Pitt because the way I like to think about it, this isn't the written strategy, but I like to think about the supply and demand of data for social impact. So on the supply side, really educating and creating a workforce of future data scientists who are engaged and plugged into social issues. We've been talking about this this whole this whole conference. So creating those education opportunities, which is a large um, a large part of what we do here with Pitt. And then on the demand side, also preparing the social and civil and, and public sectors to receive that data science talent. So preparing those organizations to reskill, upskill, um, hire, um, and carve out that, that data capacity, have the resources and tools in-house um, to be able to utilize their data and utilize um, social data to, um, to improve outcomes and, and impact. So it's kind of the way we think about it. We're really focused on the data science side of everything, but when it comes to Pitt, I think more, more generally um, trying to build up that field of data social impact as it intersects with, um, with education, with um, more general social impact, I think is how we've been thinking about it. Thanks, Shana. Um, I think you've already started tackling a bit of what I wanted to ask next, um, which Jenny left an opening for, so I'll start with you, which is how has um, Ford 
found its grant making niche within public interest tech. Shana started, so <laughs> you can continue. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, I've, I've been at Ford for a very long time, so like almost 16 years. And I think probably a, one of the reasons I love to come to the Public Interest Technology University Network Conference is because many of you who are around like my age or older have a similar journey where you were working in a discipline and you could see there was this little piece that was missing. And you were trying to tell everyone around you like, there's this little gap we need to fill together. And you probably weren't getting tons of help from the institutions where you had been trained to work, right? And what I love is, like, I feel there's this kind of joy in this space largely because, I mean, one of the panelists yesterday talked about, like, I found my family. I think there's a little bit of this. People who feel like they're now beginning to have a little bit more support, a little more structure to do the collaborative work they've seen in their brains needs to have been done for quite a while, right? Um, and some of you in the room, by the way, have been beneficiaries of the work that you guys have done, other ones of you have done. So I'd love to see like the next generation um, having an easier, easier path and building even more complex bridges than the ones that we built originally. Um, when I first came to Ford, I was brought in to do work on media or cultural policy, and we had a brand new president from McKinsey, and he was uh, narrowing the focus because the foundation has 10 offices around the world and works on so many issues and has been around for 80 years, and so he wanted a, a cleaner mission. And he said, you can only work on one. Do you want to do media policy or do you want to do cultural policy? And I said, I want to do internet policy. And he said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's like the rules to protect the public in the internet environment. And he said, oh, but all those rules have been figured out already. You know, I, I, you know, because he had been working at McKinsey with some companies who felt like the rules had been figured out. <laughs> I said, no, no, none of the rules have been figured out. And I was just so lucky that, you know, I was such so, so small potatoes, like teeny budget, brand new person at the foundation. They just said, okay, you know, make a case for that. So I did that in obscurity for a long time, uh, maybe five years. Uh, and I was really lucky then that Darren Walker, who is the current president of Ford Foundation, came in. And f he was my, I, I directly reported to him for about a year and a half. And in that environment, he realized that if we don't get it right, if we don't figure out what are the rules to protect the public in the internet environment, everybody that we are trying to protect through our programs around immigration rights, through our programs around reproductive rights and health, through our programs around criminal justice. If we're not actually thinking about the way technology is threading through all those spaces, and if there aren't clear rules to protect the public, then everyone will be hurt in that environment. So um, PIT didn't really exist back then. I mean, I think, I think many of the civil society organizations we funded who woke up every day to try to put those rules in place, they are PIT, I guess, but they were media advocates or they were policy advocates. And one of the things they said to me when I first got the job at Ford is like, please help us get some technologists. Because they all came from backgrounds where they knew the danger of media consolidation. They knew the danger of pro propaganda. They knew what would happen when some people had access to the internet and other people didn't but they didn't understand what was around the corner or what the technical fix for some of these problems were, which meant they were always just um, yelling about bad technology or responding to like explosions, but not anticipating harms or preparing for them. Um, and so we began with Tech Fellows programs. We work with Mozilla uh, we actually stole a page from the Knight Foundation, who's also been a partner in this work over the years, and we stole a, a model they had created with Mozilla to put technologists into, um, into newspapers and TV you know, journalist institutions. And we thought, can we do that? Can we put them in our civil society organizations? And what we found was our first attempts were kind of poor because we just said, oh, well, they have technical background. They're gonna come in and they're gonna be great. <laughs> and what we found was, no, it wasn't sufficient just to have people with technical background. The more rigorous and deeper their technical background, maybe in some ways the less purpose-built they were to be effective in something as you know, bureaucratic as a policy environment or as sensitive as a civil society organization. And so 
Um, a lot of the work that we were able then to do with New America, with Anne Marie Slaughter, and ultimately with Andrine was figuring out, okay, so how do we actually invest in training technologists to be more effective in these different environments? And then more importantly, how do we help really, you know, crisis crisis dealing everyday institutions like governments or civil society organizations to say, I know you've got that fire you want to fix right now, but we're going to have to take some of your cycles and some of your time to begin to think about how to do your works differently or to bring different kinds of intelligence into your teams so you can cover the entire territory that's been completely transformed by technology. So um, the good news is, uh, like, we have had true believers and partners along the way within the foundation. It's a lot easier, whereas like I started by talking about how lonely it felt. It doesn't feel lonely at Ford right now. There are all sorts of grants being made in other areas of the foundation that we don't touch at all that actually have this kind of intersectionalist attention to making sure they're thinking about the technology landscape. Um, but it's nowhere near sufficient. And then one last thing I'll say is, Almost everyone I've seen on these panels is like a superhero. Like they're doing this incredible work in all these places. They're sometimes the first people doing that work. And I love that. But if we think we're gonna solve the scale of problems that we're facing by a handful of superheroes, we're really kidding ourselves. Which is why it's so important, the work that you're doing, which is building out and normalizing and institutionalizing the, you know, the kinds of degrees, the kinds of pathways, the kinds of projects, and the value of this work, because we need it more now than we've ever needed it. And, um, and it's, it, the fact that you exist is not sufficient to the task at hand. Uh, thanks for that, Jenny. That's a kind of a nice history and po potentially kind of an evolution of how some people have come to see Pit UN and also should hopefully have given you a sense of why we frame the discussions the way we have for the last couple days. But I want to get to Katie because Katie's really been focused on sort of infrastructure challenges around um, Pit. So how did you find your way into that framework? Yeah, well, I think picking up on some of what Jenny said, there's just this incredible need to move beyond the, you know, superhero technologist, the techno-utopian perspective. One of the things that has been really striking to me as a funder in, you know, with a, with a mission oriented around technology is that so often people come to us thinking that, you know, the thrust of our mission is about putting hardware in schools or doing things with technology that will, you know, benefit people because of course technology is the answer to everything. And trying to explain risk mitigation and harm and the work that we were doing to try to think differently about how to orient the development of technology really wasn't going anywhere. And I had to come to terms with the fact that not only that, but we just, you know, we don't have enough money on our own to solve this problem. And so while I've been someone um, historically opposed to most funder collaboratives, Okay. The two that I find the most valuable are uh, Pit UN and uh, the Pit Infrastructure Fund because we do need to be working together from these different angles, um, different approaches to the problem, but kind of pooling the resources so that we can have even a fighting chance of building the sort of infrastructure that we need. And that includes, you know, career pathways. It includes some sort of regulatory frameworks and decision making that will happen, you know, at the government level. It includes the private sector being oriented differently. It includes more technologists in the public sector. All of these things matter for the infrastructure because until we have the those things in place and we can connect those dots, we're not going to be able to sustain public interest technology on its own. You know, the thing people say in philanthropy is you should, and nonprofit is you should want to put yourself out of business, you should aim to not be funding things at, after a certain point. And I don't know what, how far into the future it looks like that we wouldn't be funding these things, but I think ultimately trying to build what will what will last and making it so that we don't have to be the man behind the curtain kind of pulling the strings and connecting the dots and making the phone calls and saying, you should talk to this person and that person should talk to that person and here's $50,000 and please figure this out and here's $25,000 and please figure this out, that the, the network can sort of 
be unto itself making those connections, can be a space where there are not just a few dozen people who are the names that, that we're all making phone calls to to try to get things done and put people together, but that it is so robust that we're, it's sort of beyond the scope of our imagination. And so our journey into this and the space that we're trying to inhabit is to be in it at the core, which still includes being around the edges. So when I can step o away from the edges and know that the core is really built or when the core is really built and then I can go back to the edges and explore and find things that you know I didn't know about before, I'll feel like the work is closer to done. Thanks for that, Katie. Um, Zahad, I wanna, um, you know, ethics has come up a bit here. Uh, would love to have you ex um, talk to us about how you've seen that related to public interest technology. Does that work? There we go. Um, Ethics is you know, the core of this intervention that we're doing in the Responsible Computing Challenge, but that, that also needs to include questions of politics and justice and social justice in particular. And so that's something that we're definitely emphasizing as we move forward, not just in what the topics are that we need to get a handle of and that students who are working in these spaces and technologists who are working in these spaces need to get, get a handle of, but who they are as well. Right, so some of our investments at this stage now are looking increasingly at minority serving institutions and HBCUs as well, uh, because we've seen that you know, these are chronically underfunded institutions. These are institutions who, um, at the same time, offer some of the best models for reducing inequality and transforming people's lives. So who gets to sit at the table is just as important in the question of ethics when it comes to responsible computing, public, uh, public interest technology, um, as what is being taught in these spaces um, as well. And that's something that we definitely have realized. Another thing to mention, I think, um, also speaks to some of the points that have been raised as well. And, Jenny, I, the, the point about loneliness and finding family, I think it just, just on a personal note, is, it's, it's so, it resonates so deeply with me in terms of this community that Pitt Ewan has been building um, to find folk who care and are committed to making things happen in that space. Um, one of the, the other areas of ethics is also in increasingly holding ourselves to account as funders, right? And as funder collaboratives, right? Grantees, awardees, we need to be in a constant state of iteration and reflective and critical thinking about the political economy of the world in which we live in. R Ruman talked about this earlier today, right? It's uncom there are uncomfortable truths that we have to face as, as, as funders um, in terms of how the work gets done and how it gets funded. Um, in Mozilla, we have you know, a corporation, we have a different structure, we, we sit uh, above um, a, a corporation that helps to fund some of the work that we can do. And we are constantly in interrogation with that corporation and with ourselves in the foundation about who our co-funders are, what, what, what projects we invest in, how we do so. The answers are never perfect, but we encourage that open dialogue. We encourage that ethical reflection, and we encourage our grantees and awardees to do the same thing as well. So there are a bunch of different ways in which ethics shows up in, this, in, this, in, in, in the funding conversation. It's not just in the curricular interventions that are the, 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 the ambit of the work that I do in responsible computing, but also who gets us at the table and how we're doing the funding and how we're constantly and iteratively reflecting on those funding political economies. Uh, Shana, I'd love for you to sort of pick up that thread because um, you wonderfully led the private sector conversation. You have an interesting relationship in terms of what you indicated before about there is an existing foundation as well as a corporate side. I'm curious about how you all found yourself in the pit space as well and what's kind of um, your philosophy. You gave a hint of it, but I'd love for you to unpack that a little bit more. Yeah, I think... I mean, there's a lot in there to unpack. Um, yeah. So I think that when we came to this work originally, it was um, a really interesting opportunity to be a test bed for solutions, so building use cases that test the theories and the theory of change of what it means to build a field of data for social impact or just in general to, um, to drive inclusive growth, which is the, the broader philosophy. Um, I think at that point in time, the, the opportunity... We, we've talked a lot the last couple of days about whether this space needs more definition or less, and more structure or less. And I think in, it's in that some of the, whole, of the parts um, metaphor, right? I think that if we are able to maintain the, the diversity of 
perspectives and disciplines and um, even terminology. I think maintaining that, that difference while also being able to create a sum together, that's where the magic is, is supposed to happen. So for us coming in, um, it was meant to just start to map out some of those possibilities perhaps. Um, do the test bed thing. Um, and then also the network piece. So we want to be a network of networks um, as a company, but also I think this space only works because of that, that network effect, right? And so um, at the very beginning with Pitt, it was that opportunity to create a network of um, separate, incredible you know, conversations happening at individual institutions across the country, but applying that one blanket statement that this is all under whatever Pitt means at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think driving that kind of momentum forward, whether that continues to be through testing use cases or if it, it turns into a, um, you know, a, a, an opportunity for scaling some of these things um, across the network or within the network, um, perhaps engaging students more, um, perhaps engaging civil society and government. So thinking about it from that network effect um, approach, um, I think that's the, that's the initial reason we got into this work and this, this space, and that's what we'd like to see continue. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, I know since we're always thinking in our fundraising hat, um, and this is a donor collaborative that you've all found <laughs> helpful, uh, and it's always great to add more people into the mix. I'm, I'd love for each of you to sort of talk about the challenges or successes you have found in evangelizing your particular pit frame um, with other funders. Um, what, are, what are other kinds of foundations outside of this existing circle should we be looking to bring in? And um, let me do the reverse. I'm gonna start with Katie and then go to Jenny and then we'll come back around. Wild card. <laughs> I don't just get to say what Jenny said. Um, I think, I so, for us, you know, I, I harp on and on about infrastructure and people get tired of it. And I think there's a world in which you can absolutely talk about public interest tech and not talk about infrastructure, right? Like, I think people want to hear about things that are doing tech for good or think about product development and tech regulation. And infrastructure is boring. Infrastructure is underground. Infrastructure is not something that gets people excited. But without it, we quite literally would have nothing. And so when I, I think just a, a challenge in, in sort of evangelizing this has been really trying to encourage other funders in particular, but our partners across the board to think about not just their piece, their program, the work that they want to see sort of at the end result, but to think about how we all have to contribute to funding the, the core that I talked about, that if that doesn't exist, if we're not willing to contribute the money, then whatever program you fund will be short-lived. Whatever grant you make is going to only exist in that, in that context, and it's not going to be able to be a part of a sustainable, networked, long-term approach to solving like the root cause of these challenges. And that has been really one of my driving motivators in being involved and staying involved in our public interest technology work and trying to bring in other funders. That being said, I think the way that we bring in other funders now is to really help them see how their specific issues are related to and going to be served by the public interest technology infrastructure we're building in academia and in you know the infrastructure sort of public sector private sector at large because if you care about you know young people's mental health which is something that brought pivotal foundation to the table with us and have uh, has had them really invested in public interest technology you care about the development of, of tech moving forward if you care about health in general you care about public interest technology if you care about education if you care about homelessness if you care about any of these things you have to think about the ways in which technology can help or is harming the, the work that you're trying to do and the populations you're trying to serve. So I think there's a really strong opportunity for us to now take the incredible work that so many people in this room and outside of it have done to say, look, we are building the core, we have done all these really great proof points and join us to see how the proof points that you need to really shore up your work, to really think about the future of what you're trying to do can be enhanced by um, focusing on technology and the public interest. Sahad? I'll come back to you, Jenny. <laughs> I think um, one of the easy successes is just to be able to 
talk about responsible computing and PIT, to be honest with you. There's so much interest, especially as, as we've heard today a couple of times in, in the age of AI, there's so much interest in the space and recognition that more needs to be done that getting funders on a call and co-funders on a call to say, hey, this is important, that work has already almost been done, right? It's how do we actually make those changes to the best of our abilities with the best kind of impact that is actually really the challenge. And there's a couple of things that I'll offer um, along those lines. One of them is, you know, as, as we get to kind of collaboratives with funders, we start to see a lot more requirements that sometimes don't make sense for grantees, right? We, we start, at Mozilla, one of our core DNA principles is working open. Um, we need everything to be public access, we need things to be open, um, and that doesn't always gel well with, you know, what other funders are seeking, right? There's all the, it, when, you, when you work with uh, collaboratives of funders, it becomes more and more tricky. The other is about capacity. There's a very important integrity, in, integrity, transparency, and accountability mechanisms that are involved in the fund and grant making process, which is always in tension with some of the capacity constraints that you have, particularly with grantees who don't have resources, right? So funding always gets directed to those who do, who have the grant makers um, and the grant making teams, and that, that's a challenge, right? The capacity constraint is real, and it shapes the direction in which funding operates. And so solving for that and getting funders to realize that this is a real challenge, that we need to be not just investing in the program itself in terms of its outcomes, but also in developing competencies and capacity to around being able to even receive uh, funding in the first place is really, really important. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> the capacity challenge is uh, one that we encounter as well as we try to shape the application process in a thoughtful way. Um, we're not always hitting it out of the park though. Um, Shana? <laughs> yeah, I think to look at to look at some of, I guess you were calling them successes. I think some of them are, they're still opportunities, but one thing that we've been um, getting a lot of momentum and, and traction with is the idea of focusing on the data science um, piece specifically. Um, I think we've seen that across the network as well, where data science is seen as interdisciplinary in some ways. It happens in different places across campus than your traditional computer, uh, computer science might, or then some of our other our programs. And so taking that interdis interdisciplinary nature of data science and also the urgent nature of data science. I haven't met very many folks who don't understand or, or want to kind of get more involved in data science or see the, the impacts. Um, I think it's easier to translate into societal impacts sometimes from data science than it is from technology in general, at least at this point in time. And so we see that as an opportunity area for us to, that can kind of be a catalyst for the existing ongoing conversations about PIT that, you know, maybe, maybe technology or PIT in general is difficult to define and um, visualize from a project standpoint or a funding standpoint, but digging deeper into specific areas of data capacity building, data standards, data um, uh, network building, um, we've seen that, that be successful um, in terms of leveraging leverage impact and interest. Um, but to, that's a great transition to some of the challenges. One of the challenges um, for me in trying to translate this work is the, the time horizons piece. I think we mentioned it yesterday, Latanya Sweeney has said that government thinks in years and technology thinks in months. Well, the private sector and financial services also thinks in months or days or quarters, right? And so trying to translate how we can have an impact that is gonna be at scale someday, society-wide, network-wide, but doing it in a way that's, that, you know, we can fund something that's tangible and we see insult, uh, impact and results and kind of we can um, take that impact and iterate and grow. Translating between those two, I think, perspectives is difficult. And so I've been really um, excited about some of the experiential learning approaches that, that you have brought up, um, I think, also being able to batch things into projects, batch them into um, the labs model we've talked about. I think I've seen a lot more traction with those ideas when I bring um, this work up to, to other, uh, out to other stakeholders. Um, so timing is, it's not even time that's the issue, it's the translation of time. Uh, that's a good note for some of the writers in the room <laughs> fundraising. Um, Jenny, that question about translating it to other funders. <clears throat> yeah, so I think I've learned a lot about it. Um, we have to do two things at once. Um, 
it really is important to continue to use the public interest technology framework and to be as inclusive with it as possible because it is an intersectionalist field. And if you don't actually have a big enough umbrella where you can put the thing, the, the established hybrid, you know, um, curriculum under the bigger umbrella, then you don't get the pathways that go all the places they need to go, right? And that's why I love law as, as you know, a metaphor, because you can't imagine any entity that doesn't have some lawyers, some guardrail lawyers who make sure every contract you sign is saying exactly what you expect it to, and some visionary lawyers who think about how, say, changes to the government system or changes to what's happening in society, you know, will have ramifications for the work you do. But we don't have those guardrail technologists and those visionary technologists incorporated in entities outside of largely the private sector or academia. And that's where these huge gaps are happening. So yes, everything we've talked about today uh, about building that field is really important. But I'm going to just give you some more tactical uh, advice because of what I've learned in the last number of years of trying to sell this work to my peers, let's say. Um, and while it's gotten a little easier, the challenge is, and this is like an uncomfortable truth of philanthropy, is that philanthropies are trying to be efficient, they're trying to be accountable, and they're designing programs. Maybe a three-year program, maybe a five-year program, maybe a 10-year program and they allocate funds towards that commitment. And the people who run those programs largely don't have a technology background. And those people design and write up what they're gonna do, and tech isn't in it. But they've committed to it for three years, or five years, or 10 years. And when you come to them and say, hey, come do this public interest technology stuff, if you're charismatic enough, and you, you have your stories, and you convince them the value of it enough, you could get them to say, yeah, I've got a little bit of money over here in my like discretionary budget, and I'm going to come over and help a little bit. But this is not part of my core mission, because my mission is homelessness, or my mission is whatever. Um, we need to talk more about how PIT isn't just a field, but it's an approach, and it's an approach that's filling gaps everywhere. I really liked Larry on the first panel talking about building those trust between you know, people in different disciplines who can understand the value of collaboration and building that trust. There are far more foundations funding criminal justice than there are the future of technology. And frankly, the ones who are largely funding the future of technology stuff are gonna be tech solutionists. So in some ways, you might be considered that guardrail lawyer that they don't want to have around. They want to have, you know, the person who's just going to unlock innovation and impact without, you know, without any sort of consequences for what that actually means and for who, who is being impacted for that. So more and more, um, I, what I, you know, Andrean has been at the very beginning as part of the PITUN. And as funders, we wanted to protect the ability of the network to develop in a way that was useful to the universities that took the risk of committing to be part of it. So we were pretty clear that any donors that came into that first table weren't allowed to you know, ring fence their funds and put it just towards things that were in their program area. That you had to be allow, them, allow the network to grow based on what was useful to the institutions. But at this point, I think the network is robust enough that we should be thinking about horizontal challenges where we're recruiting foundations that care about specific issue areas and thinking about how access to the 63 universities can give them a better reach for actually achieving their goals at the intersection of that historic philanthropic area and tech. So like the simplest way is like, I'm a journalistic fund foundation. How do we get all the J schools across the PITUN competing to build the future of journalism at the intersection of public interest and tech, right? And you could do that with any other issue area. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because, you know, the people I've been able to work with, many of them at this table, have been so generous and so flexible. It's like a game of twister, justifying this work into their programs because those programs hadn't factored this need in. So you both need to make the clarity of the value and of these gaps and filling them really, really clear, but you need to work with what people need done. And it's funny, I, I always go back to Paolo Freire and his like basic organizing principle, which is if you're organizing a community, start with what they need most, 
and then bridge from what they need most into what into the systems that are failing them. So if that's like we're organizing construction workers and they need hard hats, figure out how you use your skills to help them get hard hats, but then talk about what are the systems that are making it you know, consistent that they don't get hard hats? And how do you fight the bigger fight after you've demonstrated the value of the collaboration? So it, it makes the work a little more complex, but it also makes it richer because you're not coming in as we're solving your problem. It's more about we've got a piece, you've got a piece, how do we solve it together and who are the people who are gonna give us the rocket fuel to transform all the disciplines that have yet to retrofit themselves to understand the change that's happened in the world. Yeah, and I, I think um, just as a helpful frame, as you think about all of the people that you've encountered in the room and the projects that you've heard about, in some ways, that awareness is a has kind of informed the grant making for Pit UN is um, some proof of concept projects. We funded across a range of disciplines, a range of ideas and subject matter and issue areas for them to serve as inspiration about how you do that translation. Um, I know that's a tricky road to go down because you're saying, oh, I'm not able to institutionalize this one thing. But in main, many ways, we were trying to and hoping to shape an environment where you had some examples and models and pilots to be able to say, this is how public interest tech intersects with the thing that you care passionately about. Um, so I hope that we have been somewhat successful in that. And so that's kind of a helpful tip about what we were thinking when we were doing this grant making. Um, I know this is always um, <laughs> important for us to say this, and I'm curious about this from Katie and Zahad. Um, what key questions, ideas, and grantee needs should funders consider as they are thinking about how they might um, adopt new grant making strategies that will take Pitt to the next phase? Um, I would love for your insights on that because we've talked about the collaboration um, and we've talked about, and so how do you've been really clear about the constraints and the challenges? So funders, you're interested in this space. What should you be thinking about? What should you be considering from the grantee side? Um. A lot of my grantees experience, there's a huge demand to think globally, um, especially across the institutions which I work with in the US. There's this just a global thirst for wanting to be connected on, a, on, on the scale with the work that folk are doing. How do you do that? That doesn't necessarily mean you suddenly scale up your projects to an extent and require huge amounts of funding. We spoke earlier today, for example, about how investments in local government and municipal government is really important. We shouldn't underestimate the fact, really shouldn't actually underestimate the fact, and the case study data points that those provide in radiating change, not just within a, um, a, a country, but across different cities um, uh, around the world. But grantees being plugged into those spaces is a need that I have, I've, I've come across quite a lot. I've been asked, how can you help us develop community, community partnerships, specifically for my academic grantees, right, at academic institutions, right? There is this recognized need, which has come up a couple of times just today, to rethink the idea of an ivory tower to a public square comes up all the time, but because of the kind of imperatives that we find in, um, in academic cultures and requirements, it's not always sun, uh, fr front and center in terms of the work of academics and researchers uh, who are driven to, to, to publish or perish in, 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 in certain cultures. So assistance in helping finding community partners, making community partners more prominent to uh, academic partners and the work that they do is critical, right? This is, that, that's, that, that comes up all of the time, um, and increasingly as well, how to develop community partnerships and academic partnerships on a, on a, on a global scale. So those are, those are, aside from the capacity constraints that I've seen, those are things that have been coming to me um, through my grantees quite often, um, and increasingly so with increasing fervor. Katie? Yeah, I, would, I mean, I would add to Jad's point that the global perspective is also important as we think about the sort of US Western values centered approaches we take to developing technology and the ways in which plugging into global networks can be not just you know encouraging for grantees for their ability to, to scale or to create the sort of community partnerships but also to learn from the global context and what other uh, what people in other places value and how technology development might look different from those different perspectives which I think also brings me to sort of the 
two things that I would consider important in thinking about kind of grantee considerations and this work is context and capacity. So context, I think just so often we look at this work and don't stop to contextualize it, to localize it, to make it make sense, especially when looking at community partnerships and partnerships between um, academic institutions and communities. We don't always pause to say, okay, what is what is it that I'm trying to bring to the table and is it actually something that people need in this context? Or even better, before I think of anything I want to bring to the table, what do people need in this context? And how can I learn from them to serve them better? And so I think as we're thinking about priorities for funding this sort of work, to think about, about context and to think also about capacity on both sides to make the space to do that sort of learning. I think often our, our pilot programs will look really good and you know something will seem like it makes a ton of sense in the vacuum that we've built it in and then we sort of take it out into the world and realize that we don't actually know how to execute it at scale or operationalize it with people in their real lives and that if we spent just a little bit of time and resources on the sort of you know human-centered design processes that can inform different tools being built to actually serve people's needs, that we would be better for it. I think also on capacity, particularly in the nonprofit space, when talking about public interest technology, I think we can very quickly get into the weeds or get into this big macro picture of what we want the world to be and all of these complex and nuanced uh, challenges that we're facing. But going back to what I said earlier, a lot of organizations, communities, and folks out in the world are, are still looking for someone to get them computers, right, into their, into their spaces. And so thinking about where people are and being able to meet them where they are and being able to bring the sort of resources that then enable them to participate fully, right? It's not just about the seat at the table, it's about the fully actualized, realized opportunity for people to engage meaningfully in these conversations and in this work. And so we have to help sort of shore up their resources to do that, and, and that I think is also something that we often forget. Uh, the global frame came up a bit, and I just wanna give Shana a chance to jump in, because I know that's something that is um, a staple of your work, so wanted to give you an opportunity. Yeah, um, yeah, I was nodding emphatically. <laughs> I think um, when I think it's a global framing, it's, it's partly, someone mentioned the knowledge sharing, just as much a, a sharing, a peer-to-peer -peer learning, of, if you will, um, understanding what techniques work um, in different places and how we can sort of share the, the, um, the playbooks, if you will. Um, but I think we're also, when we, when we talk about building the field of impact data science and data for social impact, we're really trying to think about it um, at that holistic view of what kinds of, um, how does that look in different regions, I guess. And so far, it has been a process of trying to bring in more and more, we traditionally apply our Western um, principles, our definitions of technology, our definitions of what data science needs to be and, and to look like um, for the civil and you know, social impact organizations worldwide. Um, and so trying to take the approach of, of listening instead, bringing in the global um, south and, and I mean a lot of university partners um, at that point, um, bringing in that perspective when it comes to saying what do we mean by the field, what do we mean by capacity, um, and what do we mean by needs um, in this area. And so I've, I think one thing that's been really really successful in that area is working through, data.org is one of our partners, they were here yesterday. Um, I don't think Emma's here today. But they've, they've tried to take that convening power globally all at once to where they're building nodes of data science talent in different cities across the world and then going into that, that location. So for example, Bogota, building university partners there, also building government stakeholder partnerships, also building up um, resources and training programs for local data science talent and social impact. So doing that ecosystem approach, but locally node by node and then connecting them all to each other. I think that could work really well in the pit space as well, right? We could learn so much from, from developing local networks, but then connecting them to each other. Um, convening, of course, is a, is a, big, uh, a big part of that. Um, but I think the other thing I was gonna say about that was um, in terms of, of questions and, and grantee needs in, in the global perspective is there's a need to invest in um, untested and new ways of doing what we've been doing. I think something that's worked really well is, is 
contributing funding to new hiring mechanisms. So with Howard University, who is also going to be here today, I think. Hi, Amy. <laughs> um, talk to Dr. A. She's, she's spearheading the Masters of Data Science at Howard University. But we've tried to do something called a cluster hiring initiative. And I've talked to a few faculty members from other universities where we're trying to fund positions that are across schools, which is harder than it, it should be. <laughs> I think, um, but trying to create carve out positions that are tenure track, so that's a long time horizon from a funding perspective, but carving out positions of people who are doing that translation. So they have a data communications um, and data com uh, social justice computing positions where people are placed um, across schools. And so I think investing in models like that, um, there's a need for that, but there isn't a lot of appetite yet from a grant making perspective because it does take more time. It is a little more experimental. Um, and then trying to connect those um, to each other is, is a bit of a challenge. Um, so trying new things, I guess, is the. <laughs> well, thank you. I've got my signal that <laughs> we're at time. And I, um, I think uh, what you have done, though, is make a case for a couple of things that folks have been hinting at already, which is this sort of um, regional approach to your work, the cluster hiring model across a cluster of uh, schools feels like it would be ready-made for that. Um, and also the sort of piece that Katie had brought in, which is sort of what are sort of the local versions of what you're doing and how do you make sure that it's really meeting the need where folks are at. I think that's part of the rationale for this. We've been charged with thinking about building a field which can feel really broad and expansive and wonderful and energizing. But I think what we're also beginning to really crystallize on is that you now have partners across many institutions and it may be time also to go deep. So there's deep and wide. All of those things have to happen at the same time. So I just want to thank um, the panelists for... Uh